I'm Bill Hessen, and this is another in our series of oral history interviews for the Palm Springs Public Library, part of a project called Prickly Pears, which commemorates the 50th anniversary of the city of Palm Springs. The date today is April 29th, 1987, and our location is the office of Donald Williams, who is a realtor professionally here in the city of Palm Springs on North Palm Canyon Drive. And as you'll learn during the interview, the building itself has quite a little history. Let's uh, go directly to uh, Don Williams now, who uh, was born here in Palm Springs and has lived here all of his life. Uh, his business is here, uh, his profession, and he's raised his own family now. And at the moment, we're sitting in a little bit of his own history. <laughs> yeah. You might refer to this building that way. But Don, let's begin at the beginning with your folks. When did they come to the desert and why did they come here? Well, my father, John W. Williams, uh, came to Palm Springs in 1919, and uh, he really came here for health reasons. He was in the service in the First World War as a Navy recruit, just a young fellow, mm -hmm. up in San Francisco, and the, and the armistice in November of 1918 came along, and he happened to have an ear infection up there, and the doctor said that he would let him right out of the service. This was about the, the first of uh, 1919, actually, in January. He'd let him right out of the service if he'd come down to Palm Springs. He had a friend who was a doctor down here, just that was here part time, and he said mm -hmm. that desert's real dry, and that ear would just heal right up. So my dad, he naturally wanted to uh, get out of the service as fast <laughs> as he could. So down he came, and uh, within two weeks, that um, ear was all uh, cleared up, and he liked it so much here, he just really stayed in Palm Springs, 1919. Decided this was his uh, kind of place. This was his kind of place, and he. He did go over to Arizona for a little while. He had a friend over there because he was originally from Kansas, but he had a friend in Arizona. He went over and visited them for a couple of months mm -hmm. and then came back and just decided this is where he wanted to stay. He must have been a fairly young man at that time. Well, just yes, he was just uh, 20, 20 years old mm -hmm. and uh, he, he did some different things. Uh, at that time, he, he got into... Uh, he had originally worked for Zaddy Bunker for just oh. a little while in the garage. When he first came When he town? first came here for a few months, and because he was quite a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of branched out soon and, and got involved with the Burgess. The Burgess, uh, which uh, the Burgess stayed over there where, uh, oh, uh, the restaurant is now, you mm -hmm. know, on, on Ramon Road there. And he started getting involved with them. And then shortly afterwards, he really started dabbling in real estate and... Uh, wasn't too long until he was full-time in real estate at a very young age. Now that's interesting because he didn't really have any business background at that point, did he? Well, not really. No, he'd uh, had a little schooling in that uh, line, but uh, just just uh, a little, and then he went in the service, and no, he just enjoyed it. Then uh, he decided, he, my mother, uh, of course they weren't married at this time, but she was back in Kansas working in a bank back there, and so he went back there shortly afterwards, and and renewed their acquaintance and brought, got married and brought her out to California. Now that was in 1922 that my mother came here. She and Catherine Finchie came to Palm Springs uh, within the same week of each other. So they, they, were, they got to know each other right from the start because they were both fresh to town. Catherine was a new teacher here. And so they were, she was a long uh, friend of our families mm -hmm. and, and uh, still a good friend of ours. Of course, she's out here now mm -hmm. in the local convalescent home and Catherine is their, their birthdays were too uh, in February, so they would always celebrate their birthdays together over all the years. I can remember many of the birthday parties they had together. It was very nice. Well, it must have been nice to come to a little town like this and find a good friend right away. Right away, that's truth, and Catherine was a fine person, and, and she just was wonderful. The little school we had up here, I can remember when I was in school there, she lived right on the campus there. She lived in a little studio apartment there, and she was the principal and uh, also taught some, but mostly the principal. And uh, it was very interesting. That's just when the Francis Stevens was the only school we had here. And then we had uh, a couple of hundred students there and that's all there was to it. You now know? that was just an elementary school. Just an elementary time. at that time. And, uh, and then, uh, well, it, it went through the eighth grade. It went through the eighth grade originally. And then, of course, a little later on, they came in with the junior high, but that wasn't that was mm -hmm. in the uh, up in the 40s, you see, before we really had a junior high separate than the elementary. And back in those early days, of course, the high schoolers went up to Banning. They had to ride a bus. Had to ride a bus up there. I never got involved in that, fortunately. I had two sisters then that were uh, born uh, here in Palm Springs, and uh, one of them, Marion, my older sister, 
she <coughs> was in the first high school class that went all the way through from uh, ninth grade through graduation. Mm -hmm. That started in 1938, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, class that went all the way through, but there were quite a number of the fellows that <laughs> had to get on the bus every day and go up there to Banning, you know, and that was quite an experience. My father was on the school board for about 10 years, and uh, he was on the local board, and then he was on the uh, unified board, which was tied into Banning and mm -hmm. the high school, and, and I remember we used to go up there occasionally when I was just a young boy we'd go up and go to a meeting, you know, and they'd mm -hmm. have the meetings up there, and it was kind of interesting. Well, you served your own time on the school well, board, Well, I too. had uh, 10 years a little later on. <laughs> a long period of time uh, and quite a bit later, but... Well, that's right, in the late 50s until the early 70s, I was involved on but the But there was a board. concept of service there. Well, yes, uh, very much so. I, uh, it was interesting back in the early times, in the early 1920s, uh, I, I've talked to my father. My father, of course, passed away in 1968, so he's been gone quite a number of years now, but we used to, we were in business together, so we, we had a chance to really uh, get to know each other and, and talk, uh, mm -hmm. father and son, so many of them don't, you know, so many of the boys go away, but we worked together for a number of years. So it was very interesting talking to him about the early days of Palm Springs. It must have been. He was very, uh, very busy and young. He, he didn't get involved in a lot of things real early because, boy, you just had to keep busy to keep things going, you know. Mm -hmm. But then he did get involved very heavily in the Chamber of Commerce. And in those days, of course, that was before the city was incorporated, we didn't uh, have any real governing body, so to speak, so the chamber just kind of took it upon themselves mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, run the, the town, in a sense, you know, as far as uh, community services and things were concerned. He was twice president. They really uh, became kind of an informal they, uh, city council. Really so, yes, they, they did. And, and, of course, we were uh, unincorporated at that time, so we were under the uh, county control. We had... Uh, the county fire and uh, sheriff's protection and that sort of thing, you know. But the chamber did a lot of good things. They used to have uh, dances up at the Francis Stevens School, the old auditorium up there. And I know we'd have to furnish, my father used to tell me, they'd have to furnish security, so to speak, you know, to keep no. the kids under control. And, even and then. One, even then, but not, you know, it was on a small <laughs> scale, of course. But uh, the different fellows in the chamber would volunteer mm -hmm. to be on duty uh, during those dances and things. And it was very, very nice. And that also, that chamber, the building up there, the auditorium building in the Francis Stevens School, was where we had our first theater. Mm -hmm. And they used to, they had a projection booth there, and they used to uh, have movies there on mm -hmm. the weekends. That's where John. Earl started his And then business. Earl, from there, the, of course, the, in the Palm Springs Village Theater was built. Mm -hmm. I can remember that, uh, and that was very exciting to go there and, and to a matinee for 15 cents, you know. <laughs> That's the old days for you. I'll bet. But well, now, when your dad started in business here uh, with his own real estate office, uh, who were some of the other realtors that he was uh, in business uh, competitive competing with, or but cooperating with too, I'm sure? Well, this little office we're in here now has been in this location since 1928. But he bought this little building down, it was down in the middle of town, about a half a mile down, we're at 423 North Palm Canyon here, and about a half a mile down on the east side of the street, this little building was there. And uh, Ray Cree, who was a realtor at that time, and he'd been a county superintendent of schools back in the, oh, in the early 1900, 1915, 16, and through there. So my father had met him when he first came to California, and he, er, Ray Cree and... Uh, Oh, another gentleman had this little office down there mm -hmm. and they wanted to sell it because they were going in other things so my father bought it and with the understanding that he would move it within two years so he bought this little parcel of land up here and then in 1928 he with uh, a team of mules if you can imagine this block building pulling it up here with on telephone poles, you know, moving them up the street. You little the pole, dowling type, uh, you know. So he, he could roll, roll the house. Roll along. I, I don't know how in the world. Today you'd never even try something like that, but he, he said they did it and it just moved right. Right up Palm Canyon right Drive. Right up Palm Canyon Drive in 1928. <laughs> and uh, John Chafee was the other gentleman at that time. You remember the Chafees, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. And he and, uh, and Ray Cree had that, had a real estate and insurance business. Can you just... All right, let's yeah. stop for a yeah. minute while you answer the phone. We were uh, talking uh, when the phone rang yes. about uh, Raymond Cree and uh, John Chafee and uh, the fact that they were uh, in the real estate business here in town, yes. as well as your father, and of course your own little building right here, which uh, you have made your office, so actually it was your dad's, now it's yours, 
It's been in your hands for all those years after living downtown for a while. Well, yes, and uh, now I have a son who's in with me now, so we have a third generation realtor here now, my son Ron. And I have another son who's also in town, but he works for John Westman Company, and mm -hmm. he's their property manager. Uh, he's a junior, we call him Gene. Mm -hmm. So those boys were both <laughs> born here. Yeah. One is 26 and the other 31. Right. And then our older son Gene has two, two children now, so it's fourth generation Palm Springs, a little <laughs> new grandson three months and a little girl three Who and knows? a half. Who knows? might be a realtor too. You never know. I, I'll tell you, it's it's interesting. Uh, the time does pass. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Don, did your dad talk about whether it was tough to do business in those early days? Where did they find their customers? Well, you know, it was interesting. Palm Springs in those early days was pretty much supported by about a half a dozen very wealthy people, millionaires in, in those days, uh, that had homes here that would come out from back east and spend the winters here. And the whole economy just pretty much evolved around those six or seven families that had homes here. The Burgess were one of the, uh, and there was a Kellogg family who was uh, had big holdings in the east that had a home here for the winter. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, a little later on, then the movie people started to come here. And uh, of course, it evolved very much around them with Charlie Farrell and Ralph Bellamy coming in and establishing the racket club but that was in the 30s a little more but it was interesting i used to talk to my father a little bit about the depression you know i was born in 1929 here and right at the uh, time of the depression but i had asked my father but he said well we really didn't feel the depression too much in palm springs because of these families they weren't too much affected by it and they had their their wealth and they didn't seem to lose it in the crash mm -hmm. so palm springs just really uh, went along very strong during the depression and we really didn't notice it like so many uh, cities particularly in the back mm -hmm. in the midwest and in the east but uh, it was interesting my uncle came here i had an uncle who came here in 1927 and uh, he went came here right after he graduated from high school in the Midwest and he went right to work and then got into the post office. My father got him into the post office and he stayed here, still here. In he fact. became He's the postmaster. A, in, he became postmaster <laughs> and then retired a few years ago and mm -hmm. is now here retired. I you'd be talking about Merritt Williams. Merritt Williams, uh-huh. Oh. And uh, he's been here a long time and uh, he he was telling me he was starting to play golf again. He had a <laughs> hip replacement here a year or so ago and He's playing golf again now, oh, and, he and he and Earl Strebe are going to have a round of golf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did your dad talk about what they used to do for fun when, uh, <clears throat> you know, when there really wasn't very much to do? Well, of course, in the early days, uh, everybody uh, was a little bit involved in with the horse with the horses a little bit. My father used to like to ride some, and in the early days, they would have. Uh, rodeos and things but just on a kind of a local uh, very much of a local <laughs> arrangement you know mm -hmm. and some of the local cowboys would get involved and do things now it was uh, in those days of course we didn't have air conditioning and i mean when summer came it got pretty warm here and uh, we as long as i can remember we always had a house in idlewild and and just almost a day school was out which was usually in uh, the middle to late may we had a little earlier in those days just the town would almost vacate. I mean, uh, there would be one pharmacist that would stay here so people could get uh, mm -hmm. uh, drugs and things. And we many times wouldn't have a doctor in the summertime because there were very few. When I was born here in, tw in 29, we had one doctor that was here with a little bit of a, a Dr. Reed. You remember mm -hmm. Dr. Harry Reed? Sure. He had a little... Uh, Oh, a little two-room hospital, if you can imagine, up here where the old Matthew building used to be up here mm -hmm. in the 600 block, North Palm Canyon. And uh, two little rooms, and that was a hospital in those days, but usually we had two or three doctors and they just had their mm -hmm. offices. And then, of course, the Desert Hospital didn't come until quite a little bit later, till after the Second World War. And then, of course, we progressed as <laughs> to what it is today. The but, people managed, I guess. Oh my, they did, and, and there were places, Banning used to be a place where they'd go up that area and they had a little hospital up there, and mm -hmm. down in the Indio area they had a little hospital. But Palm Springs really didn't get really going uh, as it is today until after the Second World War, and that's when most of the uh, people came, you know, and there were a lot of people here during the military, in the military during the Second World War with General Patton and his army down below, and 
the Torney Hospital, and then the big air base out That's here. That's right. Don, as far as you know, uh, was your dad, you, you <clears throat> said he was very active in the chamber. Was he involved in the cities and corporation? Yes, the, uh, when they, they, the, a few of them got together back in 1938, early 38, and 37 and 38, and, and they decided they should incorporate. So uh, we have a little picture here. We'll okay. see, I'll hold it up here. We're uh, going to zero in on that picture now, Don. Okay. And uh, kind of see... Uh, Oh, we've got it. Yes, this was a picture of the first city council, and they had their meetings at that time up at the Francis School in the library building there. And uh, this picture has uh, Mr. McManus and, and uh, Pop Shannon and Phil Boyd, who was our first mayor of Palm Springs. He's still living. I just saw Phil the other day. And Alva Hicks and uh, Mr. Murray and Dr. Clifflin and, of course, my father, John Williams. And uh, this is the first council. In those days, they, they were elected by districts. They didn't have, uh, you know, elections at large. And some of the districts were very small, maybe just 100 or 150 people in a district. So each councilman had a certain representation. And this council then, as I say, was really established in 1938. And they're the founding fathers of the city. And of course, uh, that's a great picture. It really. We're uh, going to look at another one now. Yes, and, uh, this is a, the Lions Club that was also established in 1937 and 38, right in through there at the turn. And uh, all the local gentlemen here, there were an awful lot. Of five, I think five of the seven or six of the seven council members were Lions at that time. This was the first mm -hmm. club. That's a great picture. And it is a good picture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it there for a minute longer so that people watching this. We'll um, have an opportunity to pick out perhaps. Well, there are some faces. people that people will know there. Francis mm -hmm. Crocker at that time was our president. Of course, we everybody knows Francis, and here's Charlie Henderson, and here's uh, Merrill Crockett, who was a pharmacist at the time, and mm -hmm. he was uh, vice president. And here's Florian Boyd, and there are just any number. Doctor Reed was there, and Guy Penny. Mm -hmm. So there are any number of people. A lot of very familiar names. Very familiar. Jimmy Cooper is still living today. He's a charter member. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just surprising. Hmm. And Francis, they were the two charter members that are still with the club. <laughs> uh, interesting pictures, particularly the one of the uh, first uh, city council. Yes, uh-huh. Did uh, your, your dad must have been very much in favor then of incorporation. Oh my, yes. They, they, uh, they were working on it through the, as I mentioned, through the Chamber of Commerce. And he'd been president of the chamber for two years there. And it really was an outcropping of that mm -hmm. activity there. And, and so they really got involved. And, and uh, Mayor Boyd was a fine mayor and, and very much involved in the whole area. And then he went on from there and became our assemblyman for this district. Then later on, he, very active. He's uh, still a very passed fine passed the legislation gentleman. that made the tramway possible. That's right. And, and uh, Francis Crocker and, uh, was really the father of the tramway along with uh, Earl, Earl Kaufman. Kaufman. Earl mm -hmm. Kaufman. And, and right. uh, that brings up, I, I remember uh, Mrs. Kaufman. They used to call her Mother Kaufman. Mm -hmm. I can remember her so very well. She had the Desert Inn and back in the very early 30s. It was just a, a real lovely place to go. and. I, I remember in those days when you'd have your junior senior prom, well, you'd either have it at the Desert Inn with Mrs. Kaufman or up at the Racket Club with Charlie Farrell. So <laughs> one year we had it at the uh, one and one at the other. So mm -hmm. you had to pass it back and forth so they didn't become <laughs> jealous of one another. Well, Don, you were born in uh, 1927. 29. Uh, 29, 29, I'm 29, sorry. that's right. What are your earliest memories of um, perhaps where you lived and people you knew? Well, the first place I can really remember living was down on the corner of Indian Avenue there where the Security Bank is. We used to own a little hotel there, the Miramonte. That and would be on the corner of right Indian there, and Ramon? Be, yeah, Indian and Ramon and the uh, southeast corner. Mm -hmm. And then we had a little home right next to it and then we had about a, a little hotel there. So that's as early as I can remember is uh, at that location. And uh, some of the early memories as a young boy, of course in those days you didn't have buses so I had to walk from there one mile up to the Francis Stevens School 
to go to school every morning and so I remember that of course and and the interesting and Indian mm -hmm. Avenue in those days just had a, a hardly any uh, blacktop on it just a little narrow street you know very two cars could get by one another mm -hmm. and but I'd always walk up Indian and the old Indian bathhouse was very evident in those days and that's when they had kind of a, a big pond of water there. The water was coming right out of the ground. That's where this spa hotel is now. Mm -hmm. And it had that uh, terrific sulfur smell, you know. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> that, <laughs> that wonderful was, fragrance. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> and then another thing I remember in the early days, we used to be very active with our desert circus. And that started in the very early 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very much local in those days. And, and the local people, the service clubs got together and the uh, different groups and the different businesses and they'd all enter floats in the parade, you know, and I remember the real estate board would be very active and uh, it was just a real good local endeavor, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some of the things and a little later on they came in with the village insanities and that was very local and and just a fine local endeavor. That went back a long way. It really did, yeah, it really did. You were telling a story that I think uh, was interesting the other day about um, the um, Easter uh, Easter egg uh, oh, yeah. hunts that uh, uh, oh. <coughs> used to be put on at the Desert Inn. At the Desert Inn, yes. Um, Mrs. Kaufman, Mother Kaufman, uh, right behind the hotel on the side of the mountain was where we had our, our first Easter sunrise service that I can remember. I think they had some before that, but mm -hmm. this was on the side of the mountain there. And uh, the people would all have to go and walk through the Desert Inn grounds and back to the mountainside, and then Dr. McCartney, who at that time was the minister of the community church, he would usually be in charge along with some of the other uh, ministers in the community. And uh, afterwards, uh, then Mother Kaufman would always put on a breakfast for the young people, and they'd mm -hmm. have an Easter egg hunt. And I can remember going to that when I was about six or seven, I, I, I probably seven, I can remember uh, I was hustling around there and, and finding lots of eggs, you know, and doing very well. And, this uh, this man came over to me and he said uh, he offered me a little something and said would you would you mention that little girl over there where these eggs are and I said well sure I'd be very happy to <laughs> so it was Shirley Temple so very interesting and she won the prize she had the most eggs because I had kind of <laughs> pointed her in the direction there and it turned out later on he was her PR man, <laughs> but no, she used Probably to come Probably busy down taking there. pictures. Busy taking <laughs> pictures, and Shirley Temple was, that was when in her heyday, mm -hmm. and she would just uh, be here quite a little bit of the time at the old Desert Inn there. It was just a lovely place there. And, uh, Did you ever get a chance to meet her? Uh, oh yes, uh, on several occasions, and I, I met her, and, and it was very, it was a lot of fun. To, to talk to her, you know, and, and she was just very <laughs> down to earth, just like any other child, you know. Another thing that was kind of interesting, I remember I used to hike up to Tokwitz Falls uh, just all the time when I was a real young boy. And back in the early 30s, about the middle 30s, they filmed Lost Horizon up there. And you can still see, if you go up there, uh, uh, iron hooks that they put in the rocks to hang their equipment to and that sort of thing. And I remember Ronald Coleman was in the movie in those days, mm -hmm. Lost Horizon, quite a quite a four-star movie yeah. than they have it now and that was very interesting and there were lots of uh, were you able to watch some of the film a little bit of the filming I remember I was about seven years old and, and I that was that really impressed me because of all the cameras and everything <laughs> and uh, and the interest and another another local uh, or early man that used to come down here a lot uh, well at the racket club so much uh, there were quite a few Johnny Weissmiller I remember seeing him he was a star of the Olympics you know and then later Tarzan and uh, Errol Flynn used to be here some quite a little bit and Paul Lucas I used to play tennis with Paul Lucas a lot and Charlie Farrell so it was it was just really interesting in those days it was just so so local you know the people were just you'd see mm -hmm. the stars up and down the street and just shopping like they, they were else. more willing in those days to go downtown and do much their more shopping so, and much and more so and the, and the the local people just took it in stride you know and it was just mm -hmm. a lot of fun of course later on things changed but but it was it was really very very interesting it <laughs> really was uh-huh well you'd have started school then sometime around 1935 Four, thirty-five. Thirty-five, right in through there. Started in the you, first you grade. You've gone to Catherine Finchie. Mm -hmm. Up here, at, well, I started uh, up Francis here at Stevens, Francis Stevens. I mean. mm -hmm. And uh, an interesting note there, I remember Fred Ingram, who was an old timer here and was a manager of the Bank of America. I can remember uh, Mr. Ingram coming up there 
and uh, telling the children about how to save money and how to go about it. And he would, we would even make deposits. And he was just very interested in the young people and to see that they got off to the right start in their saving. And so mm -hmm. that, that was an interesting thing to remember there. <laughs> and, Who was your teacher? Do you remember? Oh, uh, my. Uh, some of the there, was a, there was a Mrs. Miss Cahill I had for a couple of years. Uh, she was here many years. A Mrs. Youngling and a Mrs. Miss Newberry. But see, those, mm -hmm. those are all long gone Do you now. recall uh, having Catherine Finchie for a teacher? Well, only, she was, uh, when I got into it, she'd been here for quite a few years. She was strictly just a principal at those days. Oh. She was in charge of the whole school, and that was a time-consuming job. So she wasn't in the classroom when I, I started. She had been earlier, but then she had about, uh, oh, four or five hundred students, you see, mm -hmm. by the middle 30s. So, that was a full-time job, but they, she used to lead us. I remember we would walk from the Francis, from the uh, Stevens School down to the Mashie Golf Course back in behind where the Oasis Hotel is now, mm -hmm. and we'd have our relay days in there, you know, and we'd walk, all the children walk downtown. All They'd way. close off the street. The police would close off the street, the two or three policemen we had. And the whole school would walk down there, and we'd have our field day down there because it was a nice little uh, park-like <laughs> setting there, you know and all grassed areas, so uh, Catherine would lead that, and it was very, uh, very enjoyable and a lot of fun. Who were some of your uh, classmates in those days? Oh my, uh, the ones that people would still know today, now Bob Hillary and I, he, he lived in Cathedral, but he would come over, in those days the children in Cathedral City came over to Palm Springs to school. Bob Hillary is a name you would know, of course he was just formerly the mayor of Cathedral City, mm -hmm. and uh, Don McKinney, who was a McKinney, he's no longer with us, but he was uh, Ted's younger brother, who is still very active in the community here. And, uh, oh, there was a Vivian Gattello, who is still here, Razuto, she's, uh, oh, works for one of the doctors here in town. And she was here in those days, and, and oh, it was very interesting. We had a couple of the Indians, uh, Florentina Siva was one of the girls, and Eileen Miguel. Mm -hmm. So these are familiar names to uh, some of the people here because they're they're long old-time Indian families. <laughs> but uh, we Prieto, there was a Prieto, mm -hmm. which is a, and oh my, uh, those are the ones that are still around. They were quite. A, we had little classes in those days, maybe 25 or 30, you know. But uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and and it, we have our some of our uh, get-togethers now. Paul Summers, who came here in 1938 in the first high school. Mm -hmm. He and uh, Henry Greeley came together approximately in those early days. Now Paul is still very active in the community. He's since retired, of course, many years ago from the high school, but he's very active with the local alumni groups and mm -hmm. is doing a fine job. He so is indeed. <laughs> it's really very interesting. Some of the old uh, families, the Hicks family, Jim Hicks and I used to play a little tennis, and the Chafee boys and mm -hmm. I. and. Was Frank tennis Purcell. popular in those early days? Well, it was, but we didn't have very many courts now. The racket club came in originally with four tennis courts. I understand that, that uh, Charlie and uh, Ralph built that yes. because they couldn't get on the courts down at uh, El Mirador. Well, they only had uh, two courts at the El Mirador at that time when it was first built in the late 20s. And uh, then Mother Kaufman had one tennis court at the... Uh, at the Desert Inn, and that was about it in town. And then occasion, then we got a few private courts, very over in Las Palmas, some of the older states over there. You'll notice there are a few tennis courts that came in back in the early 30s, but uh, they were usually owned by uh, movie people mm -hmm. and very private. And so uh, to get on a public court, it was, there wasn't any such thing. So I, I can see where Charlie might very well. <laughs> so they had the four courts there, and. It was very interesting to go out mm -hmm. to the rack club in those early days. And, and did they do a, did they do any other things, Don, for uh, family family events or for kids uh, like uh, the Easter week? Um, well, that sort of thing. Easter and then, egg hunt. That well, you one thing that came along a little bit later there, Mrs. McManus. Now, in the in nineteen about nineteen thirty seven thirty eight, the tennis club was built. Now, mm -hmm. originally they had uh, uh, four tennis courts there. And I remember we used to go over there, and the, the old stream came right down through the tennis club, the open ditch there that supplied water to part of the town. And there were fish in there. On each end of the property, she had a grate so the fish would stay in there, you know. And it was very interesting. And we would fish there, and the families would all get together, and then they would cook the fish right there on the grounds of the tennis club and just have really lovely parties and things, you know. 
So you could go catch your own fish and catch have a little your own fish, fish fry right there. Cook them right there, and and. Uh, and she opened the club to. Well, it was the members usually, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of the people in town, everybody just pretty much uh, joined in those days, mm -hmm. and it was just the club to be involved in. You know, some of the other things I mentioned the horses and were going very strong in those days. The desert riders and and uh, the old polo club out where the ballpark is now. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, polo club in those days and it was they had a half a mile track there with a the polo. Charlie Farrell now used to play polo there and a lot of the celebrities from uh, Hollywood would be down and they I remember played yeah, polo. actually played polo and then they did away with that a little later on though it mm -hmm. was uh, and then they moved it down the valley more but they actually played polo and it was exciting yeah, to go out and watch <laughs> that and the city uh, the city then uh, came in with a uh, a little recreation, you know, at that time when they were incorporated, and, and they had a good program mm -hmm. here for all the families. And mm -hmm. but really, it, it people were busy uh, during the winter uh, with the little tourism, and then in the summer, everybody would pretty much get away from here and <laughs> get mm -hmm. up to the mountains or up to the wild. <laughs> down to the beach or wherever, you know. Mm -hmm. Did your mother talk very much about the, her activities? Uh... Well, a little. She was a charter member of the. Women's Club that was formed back in about 1937. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. McManus gave uh, the site where the Women's Club is now to the Women's Club. Mm -hmm. Very lovely piece of property, and they built the club. And uh, she was very active in that for many years. She was treasurer for about 20 years. So that was her main thing. And of course, when we had a little hotel, well, she was very much involved in that. But uh, which and, hotel did you operate? Well, from? it was we own the uh, it was the little uh, Miramonte Hotel down in the corner there, and, and then later, of course, we owned the Sands Hotel up in the north end. But that was mm -hmm. uh, after 1945. We had that for many years, but uh, people were busy, and the the church in those days, the community church, was very active. And the St. Paul of the mm -hmm. Desert came on about then, and of course the uh, Catholic. Uh, church over here on the corner. Bellardo was, of course, here, and the little one over mm -hmm. in section 14, and that was about it in those days. And then, of course, much later, they added on many more. But uh, that was about the extent of the activity there. Were your folks active in uh, one of the churches themselves? Well, very much in the community church, community yes. Church. Yes, my father was on the board uh, there for many years, and then mm -hmm. I was on the board as an elder of a number of years, too. That's back. The it church was, must have been very new when he first got it. Well, my, there. yes. Well, originally, see, it was downtown where the Carnell building is. That's right down next to uh, which is now the alley there, which was the old Lickin store. Well, right mm -hmm. next to it, there was the Carnell building, and the church used to be right on that corner. And back in the middle 30s, they sold that property for the unheard of price of $40,000. <laughs> my father was on the board at that time, and Charlie <laughs> Henderson and a few others. And uh, they sold it for forty thousand dollars. So with that so money, the church actually used to be located right there on the corner. Of, right on the corner uh, there. Uh, what would be uh, Palm Canyon and Andreas, uh, I guess. Andreas, right on that corner. And they sold that, and then they went over. That enabled them to go over and buy the property on Baristo, where they are today, mm -hmm. and build a new big church and a manse next door for the pro that amount of money. And mm -hmm. they had a lovely new church and uh, and what they thought was kind of an out-of-town location. <laughs> but that was uh, then in the middle 30s, Dr. McCartney at that time was the minister here and a very fine old gentleman mm -hmm. and uh, very active in those days. Did um, It would have been the community church, I imagine, yes. uh, that would have been the organizer for the Easter sunrise services. That's right, yes. Dr. McCartney was pretty much in charge of those sunrise services. And uh, they then they had them on the Desert Inn grounds, and then later they moved it up to the old O'Donnell site up above the O'Donnell golf course over here on the side mm -hmm. of the mountain. And that was very exciting because... Uh, well, now, would your dad have been involved at all in Earl C. Anthony's building of the uh, site up on the hillside up there where the cross was for so long? Not really, no. Uh, or did that come later? That came much later, yeah. yeah. That, that was not much later, but it came later, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tom O'Donnell, who was the builder of the golf course, he was a Texas oil man. Yeah. And he was one of the families that came here. and and would spend several months during the winter here and he was going to uh, make it his permanent home but then I, I think he died rather mm -hmm. young. Well, of course so, he built the home up on the hillside. Yeah he had the home on the side of the hill there and and that was supposedly his private golf course. Now he mm -hmm. is of course <laughs> gave that to the city on a long-term mm -hmm. lease arrangement so they have the committee of 25 there now. 
So that was how that got started. But no, the, the property up on top, they were going to build on that, but it just never materialized. I guess there were certain problems involved. So that's the reason that just sits there as it is, you know. But Dad was instrumental in quite a few of the developments here in town. He developed the first trailer park, the Ramon Trailer Park in 1938. They, before that day, they just called them trailer camps. Mm -hmm. But the, I remember when I was a young boy, uh, the, the state of California sent people down from Sacramento to use this trailer park as a model for future trailer parks in the state of California. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very up to date in those days, but now it's still there. But now we've got so many modern new ones, but it was very interesting that that was used as a model for the setting up the uh, requirements for future trailer parks in the state. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, he must have been involved in quite a few uh, large developments uh, along the way. Well, quite a few, yes. Primarily uh, the industrial property out on uh, East Ramon, out in that area where uh, Williams Road is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Williams. That Williams never that's occurred to me. The, <laughs> <laughs> that's after the family there. Mm -hmm. And uh, down. Uh, Oh, off of Ramon Road, he uh, did some of the developing there, and then the Ramon Trailer Park, and uh, quite a few other uh, little areas around town back in those days. But he was very active, as I said, in the Chamber of Commerce. He was president twice, and then he was president of the Real Estate Board twice, and uh, on the first city council, and, and those things. They so took a lot of time. He yes. did a lot of things. Yeah, in a lot the of things. Yes, he he was uh, re uh, in 1962. He was honored for his outstanding mm -hmm. work I from the uh, from the police really association. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it was very interesting, yes, he uh, he was very active in the community and later on at the University of Redlands we were very involved there and, and uh, they have named the building after him at the university uh, for oh. his activities in there with the university. So that was a very oh, nice. nice honor. <laughs> we were very pleased as a family. You must have all been very proud. Well, yes, very much so. Uh huh. Don, when you were a growing boy then, uh, when you were quite small, of course, there weren't probably too many things that you could really go out and do or get involved in, but as you got older, uh, you said that a lot of your social activity revolved around horses, but you mentioned dances too that uh, they used to organize at uh, the uh, Francis Stevens School. Well, yes, that was in the early days. That was really before my time. They had the dances there every Saturday night. And then, oh, yeah, that, that, that would go that, back in the 20s. That was really then. back, yeah, the late 20s and the early 30s. And then, of course, we had uh, we had a, a Boy Scout troop, which was very active in those days. The uh, down there where the uh, behind the, where the Lincoln Mercury building was, the, uh, mm -hmm. the vintage auto. Back in there, the property had been donated, and uh, we had a little Boy Scout house there. Very, and then they had uh, the Girl Scouts. My father had given property right behind the office here to the Girl Scouts back in the 30s mm -hmm. and they built a Girl Scout house there and then later they sold that and, and built the one over where it is now near the uh, near the hospital over in that area mm -hmm. but uh, the different activities uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts were very good and uh, the school activities were everybody got involved in schools. <laughs> Did many of the kids have wheels in those days? Uh, well, cars? Uh, not too many. You know, and later on in the late 30s, then the kids started having more cars. But up until then, uh, you know, very few you, the kids. Uh, they wouldn't encourage you to have cars. But in the uh, early 40s, and then the war came. Of course, then you didn't have any gasoline. So mm -hmm. really, not until a little later on. I don't believe a lot of them. I remember some of the kids actually had horses. They'd ride uh, to school or up and down the main street. It wasn't uncommon to see uh, horses right on the main street tied up in the 30s, mm -hmm. particularly up on Indian Avenue. There was a stable just right over behind the spa hotel there. And uh, there was another one down on Ramon Road, uh, just a little ways down. And Little Bear, remember Little Bear? Mm -hmm. She was uh, mm -hmm. quite a little famous cow girl. Yeah. Well, she used to take people up to Tockwitz Canyon in those days on her horses. She'd take eight or ten, and then uh, the, us young kids, we were six or seven, eight years old, we would get on the horse. When they'd come back, she'd let them off at the hotels, and then we'd ride the horses back to the stables with her, and that was a lot of fun, yeah, I remember. She'd let us do that. She must have been quite a character. She really was, and she, was, she would always lead the local parades that we had back in the early formative days. Mm -hmm. Little, little bear, she would always lead the parades. And then a little later, of course, the more famous people would lead them. But it was very much of a local effort in those days, and, and very, very interesting. Yes, it's, 
it's fun to look back. You sound as though you had a lot of fun. Really did, yes, really did. And, and I think the future is uh, just terrific for Palm Springs. Some of the things that are going on now are exciting and That's true. wonderful, you know. You, you, well, of course, with your whole family involved in real estate, it's easy to understand how you got involved, but you must have felt a real affinity for it uh, at some point in your life, said, yeah, this is probably what I want to do. Well, very much, yeah. I, I went to the University of Redlands and, and took uh, courses in business and accounting and, and real estate and that sort of thing. And I just uh, never really thought much else about except going with my father here. And uh, so I enjoyed it. I actually uh, was in the service for just uh, about three years during the Korean War. And then in 1954, I mm -hmm. came back and went into real estate with my father. And then until 1968 and his death, I was in business with him and, of course, carried right on. Then I had a son that came in with me about six or seven years ago. So it's fun. It's, it's a nice thing to have three generations in, in the well, office. The, the war must have caused, uh, the, the, the first, uh, Second World War must have caused a big change in life here, though. Uh, you would have been a little, just a little too young to be involved in that one directly. Oh, yes, uh-huh, But do you yes. remember much about what happened in the town? Well, they used to be, uh, of course, all of a sudden, we, we were just a small town in the late 30s, and then the war came on, and then they brought General Patton in down here with uh, his army, you know, getting ready to go to the tanks. Africa and the tank corps and all that, and my land on weekends, this downtown would just be thousands of soldiers it was you know and we were a very small town so it was it was took a lot of getting used to the local people they had a uh, uso here of course and they had a dugout the local women would do things and help and then of course shortly after that the the tourney general hospital was established where the el mirador mm -hmm. hotel had been and that was very active toward the end of the war and then we had the big airport out here and the that was the ferrying command, and they, all the planes from here then would be sent from here over to uh, all across the Pacific, you see, mm -hmm. and it was very exciting. I can remember one day we were out practicing football after school, and two airplanes crashed together, two military planes. One crashed and one did limp in, mm -hmm. and it was a terrible tragedy, and, and uh, quite a few people were killed in that, but it was right over just near the airport there. and. Uh, it made a lot of changes. A lot of the doctors that were here up at the hospital came back and, and then wanted to make their practice here. You know, they, mm -hmm. they really liked it. And it, it really, then after the war, things really got going and, and the town really started changing. Well, having all those young guys in town must have been kind of confusing for the local <laughs> young guys in town and the girls. Well, the girls, yeah. I had two sisters that were just a little older than I was, so they. You know, there they, were a lot of nice, yeah. That. There were a lot of nice young fellows that were here, and I remember they would have parties at our home, and they'd bring them over, you know. And it was very nice, and it, it was nice. There, were a lot of uh, fellows that were very homesick. You can well imagine, and so the local people really got together and and really entertained them royally on weekends, you know, when they had a chance to get out of the the base for a little while. Yeah. So it was it was very interesting, yes, uh-huh. And your folks opened their home? And oh my, yes, and all the other people in town did, and the church, they'd have parties over there. There'd sometimes be 200 of young people mm -hmm. over there, I remember. And it was just very exciting, and a lot of our local young men went away to the service, too. And oh, over here true. at the Legion building, you mm -hmm. can see the tribute to the, the young fellows that didn't come back. But it was, uh, we were very much involved in the war of it. My father was uh, involved. He was a little too old to go into service, but he was a, a warden. And we used to have a, a spotting uh, place here for airplanes, and that was a thing for the local people to get involved in, you know, mm -hmm. spotting the airplanes and calling them in. It was just a real community effort. Uh, they did all the things. Yeah, the all the things that days. every community <laughs> did, I guess. <laughs> yes. You look back on those days with a great deal of fondness, don't you? Oh my, yes, uh-huh. Yeah. And even even the days when you were a little too young to really be very much involved. Yeah, I was... Uh, I, I have the feeling your parents really shared a lot with you. Oh my, yes. What they had uh, done yeah. and how they had felt. Very much so, uh, because uh, as you grow up, you know, in your first few years of school, you're pretty much involved in those things, but you having two older sisters, I had a, a little more of a feeling for the community <laughs> because they were bringing things home, you know, and, and the mm -hmm. different things that were going on, so... I had a chance to really uh, get involved, even though I was very young. Uh -huh. How did your mother feel about this place when she first came? Did she ever talk about it? Did she ever have any doubts? Well, or, uh, did she look around and say, "What am I doing here?" Well, she she didn't have much to do right at first, so she got a job over it in the with Carl Licken in his store, and she was in the first post office there in 1922, 
and she worked there and worked for a few years until we got the hotel. Well, she must have known your uncle then. So, uh, well, he didn't know. She was in the post office before he got oh, here. She was he didn't come until 27, 28, and she was in the post office from 22 to 25, just oh, for a few okay. years. She knew everybody in town. Well, she because, probably knew Henrietta Parker. Oh, my, they were close <laughs> friends. She and Catherine and some of the other gals were just real close. She knew everybody in town because everybody in those days, you didn't have a mail route. You all came to the post office to get your mail. Mm -hmm. So everybody would come in every day and they'd all hang around there. The only phone we had in town in those days was at Lickin Store. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have that phone now down at the, uh, at the historical house there, you know, and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And my mother later on then was on the historical society board for a number of years now I am on the board mm -hmm. and so we're carrying that on it's uh, uh, it's doing a good job I think trying to yeah. keep some of these uh, old things uh, before the public you know and, and Sally McManus is yes, really uh -huh. done well for you yes she really is and uh -huh. the society's been very helpful to the library well Betty has project, done a good so. job there and and keeping it together and and the city has been very supportive there mm -hmm. with us and the McCallum Foundation has been very good to us so we're just really pleased. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don, is there anything else you remember you, oh, you my. thought you might share with us? Uh, well I really chatting? don't know and we've covered a lot of territory here Bill. <laughs> I have. appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you today here a little bit about some of the old times. Well, and I appreciate your taking yes. time to chat with us. Well fine and thank and, you very uh, much. And uh, I'm sure a lot of other Research people and students of Palm Springs history will enjoy this too. Well, I hope so. I <laughs> certainly hope so. Thank well, thanks you. Thanks very much to you for being with us. Fine.